everyone. Um, I hope everyone here in the room is able to grab coffee, beverages, other snacks. Um, we're going to get started in just about five minutes. Um, to the folks joining us online, welcome. Um, we will be getting started in just about five minutes, so thank you so much. This one is up. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, live. Wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. 
uh, to Friday of Climate Week. We're all surviving. We can, we will, we are, right, with a little bit of caffeine, I think, at this point. So hope, hope you've all grabbed some coffee and you're strapped in because we're going to have a fantastic conversation uh, here. We started Climate Week with increasing ambition around the tripling of renewables. We had leadership from governments, we had leadership from the private sector, leadership from philanthropy. We're gonna hear from all those voices here today. So excited to have you joining us. Um, you know, I think no better person to set off or set up the conversation here than Daniela Violetti. Daniela is the Senior Director of Program Coordination for the UNFCCC. Daniela, you have seen, you know, kind of this evolution over the week. Could you come up provide us a little bit of background and opening remarks just to set the stage for us here in the conversation today. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning to all of you. Yeah, uh, long week for all of us, but uh, I, I feel that uh, it was a, a good week. At, at the end, uh, I can say that uh, conversation that took place uh, were quite relevant for, for our common agenda. Um, well, first of all, good morning and thanks thanks for having me and a pleasure to say a few words uh, and sharing some thoughts with you. Um, I don't think I have to go back to the IPCC science uh, important messages that have been given to us in terms of the urgency uh, to take action. And uh, in, in those very, very sobering messages, there are still a, a couple of important uh, uh, opportunities that if we are taking uh, the right steps uh, quick we are still uh, in the space that we can uh, remain on the 1.5 degree path um, and the, the two key messages are of course we have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions we know the 43 percent by 2030 is our uh, our goal if we want to stay on the Paris uh, agreement goal and the other one is that the solutions uh, exist and the solution that we are looking at of course is this uh, energy transition in which uh, uh, renewable energy are uh, an essential element of that uh, so we do have the technology we do have the solutions uh, uh, what is is really needed is is to go to scale in, in, a, in the most efficient and low cost options uh, and so all of, of uh, the, the conversation that are taking place now are really how to do that um, Energy transition uh, at last year COP in Sharm El Sheikh was already featuring quite prominently. So the overarching, the, 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 say the cover decision, the overarching decision uh, there um, really underlined the importance and stressed the importance of uh, um, enhancing uh, uh, clean energy in, in the mix. And, um, and of course recognizing the, the, the national circumstances for, for making this happen. Um, now we are in, uh, uh, a few, I think we are 68 uh, days ahead of COP28 in, in Dubai, so it's coming up very, very soon. And I would like to quote one of the um, paradigm shift that uh, the incoming COP28 uh, president uh, announced in his vision for the COP, uh, which says COP28 presents an opportunity to fast track the energy transition by building the energy system of the future while rapidly decarbonizing the energy system today to keep 1.5 within reach. So that's, that's really uh, what we are all looking for. Um, and then now comes in the, the, the conversation about the, the possibility of a global target uh, to triple the global capacity of renewable energy by 2030. Um, this is really uh, a moment of, of uh, uh, and, and you know, you, you ask me how, how this uh, was during the week. Uh, it came up. It came up uh, in different conversations, in different fora. Um, we have this year a unique opportunity in the climate change process, which is the first global stock take. And, and this is being called uh, uh, by many the, the opportunity to course correct, to really change the path, not only for uh, 2028, which is the so second global stock take, but really to looking at uh, into the future and, and and we need really political leadership to make this happen because it's it's possible um, but we need to really to strengthen action in all areas uh, um, in the context of that uh, uh, global stock take and i'm saying it is not only mitigation we need to look at equally in advance with adaptation and means of implementation and action by all uh, uh, stakeholders so non-party stakeholders 
So the discussion of uh, trapping uh, renewable energy in, by 2030, I, I think is on the agenda now. And, and again, I want to uh, read a piece of the G20 New Daily Declaration, uh, which, which says efforts to trouble renewable energy capacity globally through existing targets and policies, uh, as well as demonstrate similar ambition with respect to other zero and low emission technology, including ab abatement or removal technologies in, in line with national circumstances by 2030. Again, G20, this is, you know, I think we can all feel that uh, um, is on the agenda. Now, the question and the discussion you will have today is really how to do it, uh, how to remove the barriers, what are the opportunities, uh, um, the gaps, and, and, and do it in, in the most uh, equitable way. So this is something that is really important so that developing countries can also receive the support needed uh, to embark on this, on this journey. So um, I, I think I can stop here and, and, and really wishing you a, a good conversation, but it's really timely, it's really important, it's urgent. Uh, and, and I think uh, um, the sense I'm, I'm feeling around by, by listening to, to leaders and, and, and uh, all stakeholders is that this is a really a, a possibility that is uh, for COP28 is becoming real. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for joining us here this morning, uh, Daniela. We're, we're blessed to have you here. Um, you know, we, so we heard, right? We have the tech, we have the solutions, we just need to bring them to scale right now um, as the primary. I will say 68 days, right? I'm sure it wasn't about, I'm sure you're counting and you've got a little check mark on your calendar that says we have exactly 68 days to get this. And uh, part of the conversation here this morning uh, is to respond to that, right? And make sure that we're, we are using every one of those days to build momentum toward a tripling. Um, you know, in the same way, though, the global stock take talks about stocks, we need to think about flows, right? Because what, what matters, and for those who are mathematicians, derivatives matter, right? The rate of change, how quickly we're accelerating into the transition to get to that scale is super important. And, and so no one better to, uh, to talk to us here about that than RMI's own principal, uh, Laurent Spielman, who has been thinking about working alongside the Systems Change Lab and Bezos Earth Fund and others, specifically to understand some of the flows that are happening. And I, I'd like to invite you up here, Laurence, to, to share some of your findings. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you, John, for the kind introduction. Uh, and thank you also for the encouraging words uh, towards Scott Daniela. Uh, it's really, really great to hear. Um, I'll take you on, some, on a journey on some research and, and thinking that we've done over the course of the past couple of months, but honestly, in the last couple of, uh, of years. One thing that we've done together with a group of partners uh, that are mentioned here below. So John mentioned already a couple with Basis Earth Fund and, and Systems Change Lab, uh, but we've also worked um, recently with, with the IEA and Global Optimism and TED Countdown um, to create a, um, a narrative and research on the latest trends on the energy transition. Um, and I'll take you on a, you know, two different realities. And, and um, I think this is one thing that many of us um, kind of balance and, and struggle with on, on a day-to-day -day basis, I sure do. Um, but one of them is the reality um, that is, I think, highlighted quite well on the global stock tech, uh, that we are off track and that we are deep in a climate emergency, that we are experiencing losses day to day, uh, and also a realization that we've really wasted time. But there's a second reality um, at play at the same time, uh, which is that we, that we know what the solutions are. So all the problems are here on Earth, but at the same time, uh, we also know what the solutions are, and they are, they are, they're really ready. Um, and also an encouraging um, trend that we see is that exponential change is happening globally. Uh, across all kinds of different technologies and processes. Something that all of us work on very hard day to day to make that happen. Um, and also that, we, uh, that we've learned from history, and I'll, I'll take you on the, in the journey um, in, in a little bit, uh, that extraordinary transformations are possible and often that they can happen very fast. Um, and lastly, that the pace of change depends on all of us. Um, and a very important concept here is to think not only linearly, but also exponential. So often if we uh, think about the future, we think about the rate of change and the changes that are happening in the last year, 
or the year before, uh, and we extrapolate them linearly, expecting that the world of tomorrow will look like uh, that of today. But one thing that we've experienced, all of us, in our lives many times, is that things can happen quite quickly. Just think about uh, mobile phones. I'm, I'm sure many of us here in the room uh, were, at, were there at the moment, uh, kind of a realization that you can take pictures with your phone. Um, and it was useless. Like, in the beginning, I thought, okay, well, why, why would I do this? I have a camera. Uh, but at some point, there was this, uh, this click when I sent a picture to, uh, to my family or to my friends that I realized, wait a minute, this is actually great. Um, and this, this happened in a time span only of a, of a few decades. It's a completely different world that we live in now. Uh, and this mindset about how the future can look very different from that of today, I think is very, uh, is very important. And also something that we can keep in mind to show that the tripling uh, of renewables in 2030 is really possible. Um, and um, I'll, take you to, I'll take you through a couple of data points and, and research that's been done to show this. So first of all, in the last year, um, the clean energy transition saw a huge jump. This is data from the IEA, latest report from the IEA, um, about uh, the increase in, in, in all kinds of different technologies across the entire energy system. Uh, and it shows an incredible, um, an, an incredible evolution in how quickly the, the energy transition is unfolding. So it's moving fast, even, even if we look at the data from the last year. But if you, look, uh, if you look backwards a little bit longer, this is not a fad. This is not something that, that only happens once. It's part of a larger uh, trajectory of change that we have observed uh, over the course of the last decade or actually decades. Uh, so um, step by step, for, for a lot of key technologies in the, uh, in the energy transition, we have worked towards a price tipping point, towards a moment uh, where we go from slow change to faster change. And across many technologies, this is a point that we've now actually reached. Uh, so um, one, one thing that we've done in our research is that we look backwards. So we looked, okay, this is the exponential change is happening. We, we, we see this happening now. But what does this mean and what does this mean historically? So John already mentioned the concept of stocks and flows. Um, and we've, we've looked at various um, revolutions that have happened in the past that, that are not only uh, a single technology, but it is actually a combination of technology and also includes replacements of all, all technologies. So here's just three examples of in the industrial revolution, the age of oil, and the information revolution. And I think in particular, the industrial revolution is very interesting, um, as it's really a combination of all kinds of different technologies. And it started with a single innovation, the, the, the steam engine, or actually before that, the water wheel. Um, and one thing that we've learned is that step by step, um, all kinds of new technologies are also built upon the old one. So for example, the steam engine started, um, started in the textile industry, in the UK and it spread globally from there. But also it led to all kinds of other innovations in all kinds of other different areas, which is something we currently observe um, in the energy transition. Um, so for example, one thing that happened in, uh, with the steam engine is that at some point in the age of steel, the um, uh, trains were being developed. And this is also something that we've observed, where we have observed uh, exponential growth in, um, in, in the advent of, of train. I mean, I think many of us realize uh, or know about the, uh, the revolution that happened in the US in terms of train travel. Uh, with all its, um, and, and this is I think one thing that, that I realize is that it's not only about things like phones or something very small, but it's also about something very large. Um, so train tracks and entire railways, uh, railway networks are built track by track. You start with, you start with um, uh, one route, and then you add another route, and then you add another couple of routes. Uh, and before you know it, you're on exponential trajectory. And this is not something we've only seen in trains, uh, but we've seen in many, many, many examples before. Um, so one thing that we've done uh, in our research is, okay, what, what have we learned from the past? What does this mean about what we can expect or hope for and aim for for the future? What is actually not only a, an ambitious target, but also a likely target that we can make? Uh, so we've done this research now on, uh, on electricity and on cars, um, and what we realize is if we continue this exponential trend, so if we learn from history and we actually look at electricity generation, uh, then annual, annual renewables build out to exceed one terawatt per annum by 2030. What this means, what our research means, is that actually the tripling of renewable capacity is really within reach. We can do it. We've, we've done it in the past, um, and we can do it, we can do it again. 
Uh, and what this means is we, we did a couple of, um, a couple of different ways. Uh, this, this maybe gets a little bit nerdy, but there's different ways on how you can model, uh, model S-curves. Uh, and we've done this in a variety of ways uh, where we result basically at two pathways. One of them is fast, one of them is faster. The implication of these, uh, of these two um, is that tripling renewable capacity is feasible by 2030. And if we push it, we could even go faster. So our research, the faster track, would even show uh, that we can push it towards four times. So I believe that this, um, that this research shows that it's really it's possible and we can, we can do this. Uh, and one, one additional piece that I would like to mention is that solar and wind uh, costs are going down very rapidly. Um, and we expect this to continue uh, moving forward. Uh, solar um, more quickly than wind. There's a very simple reason for this is that technologies that are smaller and more modular reduce in cost more quickly. It's easier to experiment. It's easier to fill uh, and to try things out. So uh, technologies that are a little bit smaller can reduce in cost even faster. And despite this progress and, and despite the possibility, the, neg the negative narr narrative remains dominant. So one thing, and there's a couple of, I think, nice quotes on the, on the right-hand side about real travel and about, uh, about the internet and about cars and that the horse is here to stay. Um, and we, we, we see this kind of quotes and conversations happening uh, in, in, our, um, in, our, in our conversations day to day. Uh, and this is a frame of reference, uh, again, the, the exponential mindset that I hope uh, you can take with you after today, uh, armed with some of the facts that I presented here today. And um, that you can show um, that, uh, that we can do this and that we can even go faster. However, and this is, I think, also something we realize day to day, that this exponential change is not inevitable. And the pace and the work depends on us. Um, and there's two, there's two different phases in, uh, or two different types of these conversations. One of them uh, is the drive to cost parity. So there's a lot of technologies that still need a lot of work to, uh, to push it forward and to actually get to that moment of price parity. And this requires different kinds of interventions, different kinds of policies, different kinds of coalitions uh, compared to the second phase, which is about the, the, the driving of momentum. And the second piece that I would like to highlight uh, that also requires a lot of uh, uh, thinking and attention and effort um, is the global distribution. So also one thing that we've learned uh, from the past is that quite often um, technology revolutions, they, they come from a single place or a set of different places and they, they spread out from there. Um, but this is also not inevitable. We can, we can make sure um, that the technologies are spread out more equitably and that they create a better world. Um, and I think this is also something to realize and especially towards the uh, towards, towards the global south is where actually the, the largest opportunities for this renewable revolution also lies because there's the resources, there's the land, there's the sun, uh, and there's the people that can help make that uh, transformation happen. Uh, but that requires a lot of effort um, and, and, a lot of work, uh, and a lot of work. I would like to end with a question to you to help amplify this message, um, to take this data, uh, I'll share a link shortly uh, where you can look at some of the reports. And also we had a, a conversation last, uh, last Tuesday uh, with uh, Richard Branson, uh, spearheaded by, by, by John, which was, which was really great. Um, I saw the slides of his presentation. Um, and uh, Richard Branson um, quoted, and I, I thought it was quite nice, um, that it was once thought that real travel was too dangerous, that the horse was here to stay, and the internet would collapse. The world moved on and progress was made. We can make a utopian world a reality if we stay on track with the renewable revolution. Thank you. Give me a little bit more tether there, a little bit more leash. Good. Um, well, thank you, Laurence. You know, we, we are not, as a, as a species, really, equipped to think nonlinearly. We don't think exponentially very well. Um, and, and this is something that we've gotta, we've gotta recognize, that this is, the energy transition is fundamentally a technology disruption, 
Technology disruptions and displacements happen on S-curves. They happen non-linearly, right? And they can be driven by us in the end. Um, you know, Laurence didn't talk about the numbers around our EV uh, adoption rates, but, but if you look at it, one in 25, 25 cars two years ago globally was an EV. This year, one in five cars sold will be an EV. In 2025, one in two cars sold will be an EV. In 2030, three in four cars sold will be an EV. And by 2040, there will be virtually no demand for oil globally from internal combustion engine four-wheeled vehicles anymore on the planet, right? If you look at how technology disrupts. And that's something we can all find encouraging, but at the same time, you know, and I'm gonna go to famous Moore's Law. I'm, many of you may have heard of it, right? Semiconductor industry, early days, uh, computer scientists said, we can double the rate of transistors on a, on a chip every two years. Um, and we did that. We did that for multiple decades at a time. And that didn't happen de facto. It happened because there was constant innovation constant technology innovation, constant supply chain innovation, constant challenge and competitive innovation happening across the market, and constant collaboration to make that happen. And it was all about setting the goal and then delivering the goal. So we're gonna talk about delivering the goal here with three different perspectives up on stage joining me, one of the government, one of the industry, and one of philanthropy here. Um, and I should have said four, uh, because one also joining from an equity perspective, uh, specifically addressing the challenge of how do we make sure that everyone participates here. Um, and so I'm very pleased to have me, uh, to join me on stage. First, Antha Williams, who is the head of environmental programs at Bloomberg Philanthropies. Welcome, please join me up here, Antha. <laughs> Second. Bruce Douglas, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Global Renewables Energy Alliance, or Global Renewables Alliance, I'm sorry. Thanks, welcome, Bruce. Third, Dr. Vera Rodenhoff, who's the Deputy Director General for International Climate Action and International Energy Transition at the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action for Germany. Um, and, and finally, Charles Wanguhu, who is the director of NZ Ijayo Africa Initiative. Um, yeah, we might need to untether some of these mics to give you a little bit of room to speak. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you all for joining. It's fantastic to get all your perspectives here this morning. I am going to just kind of migrate from, from Dr. Violetti's, you know, kind of global compact perspective over to that of Germany here. Um, and, and, you know, Vera, I wanted to start with you because Germany has been a pioneer in the renewable energy deployment since the early 2000s with the Energy Venda. Um, you're a leader, you know, in thinking and, and actually practicing exponential growth that Lawrence just talked about. Um, and you've been an early advocate and a champion, really, of this global target that we're talking about today. Can you just frame for us, why is adopting such a target critical and urgent, and especially at this COP, right? And how will it be different from calls to phase down or phase out fossil fuels? Um, yes, gladly so. So um, the focus is obviously on uh, staying below 1.5, uh, having emissions. Um, by 2030 really related to 2019 and uh, when we talk about fossil fuel phase out or coal phase out um, that's a that's something we need to do but it's not necessarily a positive narrative so um, what makes us or enables us to phase out uh, fossil fuels and coal is really that we have other technologies like renewables and it's not just a renewables target the target is renewables, tripling renewables, doubling energy efficiency, and at the same time, phasing out fossils. So if we um, say, and it is possible to say, we can, and we heard it, we can triple renewables globally, 
by 2030. Uh, the IEA and IRENA have both come to the conclusion that, uh, which that means then is 11 terawatts renewables globally by 2030 is ab actually absolutely doable. It's probably even more can be achieved, but this is something that can be achieved. Energy efficiency, doubling energy efficiency, which means yearly um, doubling the rate of 2% to 4% energy efficiency is also low-hanging fruits. It's something we can do easily. And if we say we can do this, the means are there. They're readily deployable. They're the most cost-effective means to do it. And by doing so, we can actually, for all countries, achieve more energy access where it's needed still, energy independence, energy security, plus other benefits like health, you know, clean air, all of that. And this is a key competitive advantage and it's a development possibility which we're giving there. So this is the message that has to come across because uh, we have to instill the confidence of the people, the communities, the businesses, and the investors. And this is also a key point around uh, this tripling narrative because we need the finance private sector finance especially to go into renewables and if we keep having this kind of doubts about renewables if we don't give a clear signal where we need to go then the investments won't go there so this is why we think we or we are convinced and we already see it happening that if we have that narrative that the tripling is possible confidence and investments will go there Wonderful. Uh, so it is narrative. It's it's you know kind of setting that ambition uh, appropriately for the response. Um, I as a Rocky Mountain Institute, of course, we love to hear energy efficiency. We always think of that as the least cost way to provide the next bit of energy that we need. It is incredibly cost effective. Um, so encouraged by that and your leadership there. But I, I just want to move to you, Bruce, because you represent a lot of industry here. And, and the question is, can industry rise to this, right? If, if governments like Germany and, and others around the world set the target, can we deliver? And, and if we can't right now, what barriers need to be overcome in the process? Yeah, thanks a lot, John, and thanks so much for the invitation. You know, RMI is a true inspiration uh, to, to us and to our members around the world, and we really appreciate the great work you're doing. So the question is really around the word challenge. I mean, I could easily say, yes, we can, and it's true, yes, we can, but, and there's a big but, there are some serious barriers uh, to meet that challenge. We as the Global Renewables Alliance uh, announced on Monday a campaign to triple renewable energy to at least 11,000 gigawatts by 2030 and double energy efficiency rates. Uh, but within that call, and it was uh, a letter to world leaders, there was quite explicit enablers and urgent policy action. That's the most important message to take away is that we require immediate action from governments to trigger this, this scaling. And just one of them, which we were discussing earlier, was financing. And financing not only in the global south, but also in the global north, is a huge challenge. We in the renewables industry, our fuel is not gas or oil. We don't burn that, we burn capital. And we need access to low cost capital, and specifically in the global south. So whatever levers we can pull to enable that, and we were discussing bottom-up or top-down. Policy is critical for that, but also some bottom-up enablers as well. It's interesting this week because, you know, we launched that to, you know, made a lot of noise about it, and, and I apologize for those in the room who have probably seen me present that like 10 times this week. But, yeah. And if you're on social media, on LinkedIn, you've probably seen enough of it. But we, we took out a full-page advert in, in the New York Times on Monday. Uh, so it is double down and, and triple up, so energy efficiency and the tripling renewables, but also the message about the urgency. We got um, over 250 organizations to, to sign that, and RMI was one of the first to come on board. Um, but not just the renewables industry, and that's the point I'm trying to make, is that inevitably for us there's some benefits in it, and we, you know, it's on us to deliver, but also signing the letter was a range of uh, global NGOs, 
and the corporate demand sector. So we had significant amounts of large uh, off-takers sign that letter demanding more renewable energy. And so we had Apple, Google, Microsoft, Unilever, PepsiCo, and so on. Something like $12 trillion of market value was represented. And during the week, we also launched some initiatives to, to help facilitate that scaling. So on Tuesday, we launched a permitting paper, a nine-point plan, specifically focusing on accelerated permitting. On Wednesday, we launched something on corporate demand. And just yesterday, we did uh, some work around supply chains and value chains. The one I do want to focus on, just as a barrier, which is a no regrets uh, solution for governments, is permitting. The example in Europe I'll give, just wind alone, there's 80 gigawatts of wind energy capacity stuck in pipelines. So it won't cost money to un un unlock that, and it's relatively quick and easy to do. It takes longer to permit a wind farm than it does to build one. That's shocking. Truly shocking and needs to be addressed immediately. The EU has introduced some great measures to accelerate permitting, and we hope to use some of those best practices in other markets around the world to show how this can be done in a way that also involves communities, early engagement with communities, benefits for communities, nature positive, and so on. So it can't just be done you know, without, um, without those concerns. But I'll stop there. There's several other barriers I can touch on later, um, grids and, and the value chain piece, but I think the permitting is a key one just to get this going. Thanks, John. Thanks, Bruce. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more here in a moment, but I, I do want to move to uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies. Antha, you and the team do amazing work here, unlocking, in particular, Bruce cited capital as being a, a key issue, helping to solve issues around technology, um, uh, around capital access, around you know, supply chain issues, um, especially you know, in the global south as well. Uh, just give us a sense of where you're focused, what, what, where you're seeing traction, you know, kind of what's helping you, and what are some of the headwinds you're facing, too? Yeah, well, thank you so much, John, uh, and thanks to RMI. You've been a terrific partner of ours at, at Bloomberg Philanthropies, and think this new research is just very uh, compelling and focusing and, and important. Um, and really appreciate all of you who are here. It's, uh, it's been a great week of conversations and a lot of momentum, um, but, but also uh, you know, Im impressed that you're making it here for this conversation on a Friday morning. Um, Bloomberg Philanthropies is the home of all of Mike Bloomberg's um, charitable work, and on the specific topic of energy transition, um, we really started in wealthy countries in the US and, and the EU, and um, supported both the work to phase out polluting fossil fuel assets, but to pass the policies and programs to enable much faster adoption of, of clean energy. And um, we've seen how that kind of work and the enabling environments on, on policy lead to the kind of curves that we're talking about here in terms of, of investment. Um, we've really expanded that work, uh, so it's, it's now US and Europe, plus about 30 other countries with a big concentration in um, the Global South and in Africa and Southeast Asia and, and Latin America. And, and on that work, we work on both the, the managed phase out of fossil fuel assets in wealthy countries, but also the dramatic uptake of, of clean energy um, in, in developing and emerging economies. And I think for us, um, there's always the question of where a um, philanthropic dollar is, is best spent. Um, even with the resources of somebody like Mike Bloomberg, philanthropy money is always going to be relatively small compared to um, public budgets or private sector investments. And we know that there's money to be made here, and we know that there's positive social benefit in the opportunities provided by the energy transition, um, but it's, it, it can be a rocky road to get from here to there. And so um, a couple of the things that, that we think about in terms of um, this question of how to drive more investments um, in, in the clean energy transition. First, as I mentioned, we, we really focus the philanthropy dollars on policy and, and creating the enabling environment for, for the investments that we're talking about. And so um, in Indonesia, as one example, we work with local foundations, think tanks, university and research partners um, to really do the landscape assessment and identifying the potential solar projects. And, and that's with a particular focus on the Java and Bali islands. Um, but we really also work to assess the local needs on the ground to help create the um, kind of pipeline 
um, that's going to drive investments more quickly. And so where we see philanthropy dollars within that well spent are on the things like um, modeling and scenario analysis and just the kind of information that we might take for granted in other geographies. Um, but are, are urgently needed um, in the short term to enable um, these projects to, to get developed. And, and I would include nurturing local talent um, and, and homegrown solutions in those places as a, a key kind of piece of our approach at Bloomberg. Um, the other thing that we try to do as philanthropy is really convene the right players um, and facilitate the kind of connections um, between actors um, in, the, in the sectors. And so, we think about that here in terms of the, the project developers and the financial institutions. Um, and so on that, we collaborate um, where we can with the multilateral development banks, the Asian Development Bank and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, just to support the kind of knowledge exchange and clean energy preparation across Asia. Um, but finally, we also work to, to um, maximize uh, the, you know, Bloomberg, um, kind of uh, network and access to some of the private sector players. And so we work closely with um, the global net zero financial institutions um, to begin to just draw focus on the investment opportunity really directed by um, country specific and region specific approaches. So one quick example on that is a new climate innovation and development fund that we did with the Asian Development Bank and with Goldman Sachs to exactly do this kind of idea of, of preparing the projects, pointing to them, but then driving the kind of private sector investment that, that hasn't been there in the past. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Antha. And so, you know, uh, philanthropy, so catalytic, a small portion, but an important portion, just to get the market started, right? And, and as we think about markets that need to get started, right, there's one in Africa that is still you know, potentially in, in Secretary General Guterres's words, you know, a, a energy superpower, right, of the next energy economy that's in the waiting. And there's lots of activity and interest. We saw the African Climate Summit here a couple weeks ago really start to, to raise the ambition and focus everyone on the equitable and just, you know, kind of development of, of energy in Africa. You know, Charles, you're a leading voice in the space and would love for you just to reflect a little bit on, you know, what does a tripling target mean for Africa here? How does it help you rise to the Secretary General's, you know, kind of ambition for Africa and all of our ambition for Africa to lead in this moment? Yeah, um, thanks, thanks, thanks for that. I, I just realized that the first meeting we had at Climate Week was actually there in, in Bruce, and so it's fitting that our last, the last panel for us is also the last one. So I also promise this is the last panel that I'm doing, so we can almost switch notes, and uh, it's good to see Bruce's paper is getting pretty worn out in terms of, um, of showing it. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's more of an Eliza note. Um, I mean, let me just start by saying, I think, you know, somebody said, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. And so for Africa now, it's just that where we are at now is either Africa becomes the last bastion of, of fossil fuel sort of um, use, uh, including even, you know, for internal combustion vehicles. At the moment already, we import, you know, over seven-year-old vehicles. And so that's, that's the risk that we're talking about. And that's why for us at the Africa Climate Summit, we didn't even stop at tripling. We talked about five times, right? Um, and five times renewable for the continent, you know, it sounds like a big, like a big figure, because already at tripling, you're saying it's tripling possible. But um, in terms of the context, um, if Rwanda was to multiply by five times, it's still, it's only going to reach about a thousand, over, over a thousand megawatts, right, for a population of over 14 million people. And so it's, it's those kind of things that you're saying in terms of there's already a, such a huge vacuum there that you need to start addressing now before people start being given um, other solutions. And so um, post-climate summit, um, you know, we've got a good declaration in terms of the five times, um, so 300, I think, gigawatts of uh, renewable on the continent. And so what's happening now is drilling down into the country specific in terms of how do you actually get it done. Um, and so. For us in Kenya, uh, where I'm from, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm based in Nairobi, I should have started with that. Um, we already started looking at what does it look like for, you know, 100 gigawatts of renewable for Kenya, right? And so we, we held convenings, um, you know, including private sector, because, I mean, we need that collective effort, not only the, you know, private sector, the independent power producers, uh, Bruce's people, but also 
who are the off takers for you know these opportunities um, the financiers who need to come in and we started that conversation on the continent in terms of how does that actually look out how does it play out and one of the things that we have to address is that it can't be business as usual, right? It can't just be this, this idea. And, and one of the things that you know, Bruce identifies in terms of the, the length of getting these projects off the ground is because of how Africa is, is viewed, right? And so this idea of you have to de-risk the project, which means you, know, you have to get the government guarantees or you know, um, sort of the long take or pay contracts that are needed just to get the projects off the ground means that the level of engagement, you know, you're not only going to the Ministry of Energy, you're going to the Ministry of Treasury. Um, Treasury in a lot of our countries now are sort of debt distressed, right? So even that straight jacket within that debt situation that you have does not give governments that leeway to actually be able to guarantee some of these contracts. And so that's why, you know, it, it cannot be business as usual. I mean, philanthropy has to, you know, uh, play that catalytic role as well in terms of just sort of that engagement, but also unlocking that level of investment. Um, and just lastly to say, I mean, for us, you know, energy access, you're talking about the end. So as part of the climate summit, we had all these beautiful, you know, uh, sessions, sort of high level. But one of the sessions that actually caught my eye and, and I sat through was sort of what does energy access mean, you know, even for African women, for example. There's a lot of tokenistic sort of, uh, when you talk about African women, you talk about clean cooking. but um, at that session, they broke it down in terms of energy has a security element, for example, for women. Um, and that security element is also an entrepreneurial session, right? The, the woman who's trying to wake up at 5 a.m. to go to the market to access so that she can come and sell goods needs that energy access as a security uh, question. So, I mean, security has, if you, and you have to link all these things together so that you say, you know, there's health outcomes, there's education outcomes of energy access. And so for us, that's a critical thing. And so, bringing in a big off-taker who can you know, sort of take up that big cost so that you can increase energy access at an affordable level is what is critical. Thanks. Yeah, no, thank you, Charles. And I'm, I'm struck by the numbers here, right, when we think about it. 300 gigawatts of, of capacity installed, that's roughly the amount you know, for, for Africa over the next seven years, that's the amount of solar we produce this year, right? And if we can't get one-seventh of our capacity over the next seven years, toward one-seventh of the population, right? Um, it feels like we, will, we won't have created the equitable you know, transition that's really required, even as everything continues to grow. So this is, this is a big challenge, right? And it's one that can't only be solved by the private market. It needs some government support here. And, and Vera, I'm gonna turn back to you on, you know, how exactly do we get reassurances, right? That Charles and all of the African leaders' ambitions are going to be supported by governments here going forward. What, what can governments from the global north do to make sure that Africa, that Southeast Asia, that, that uh, uh, South America, Latin America aren't left behind here? Um, well, first of all, we can lead by example, although we have very different uh, conditions, but I mean, and it goes to also the permitting processes. We are working in Germany on, on speeding those up. Uh, but yes, there are, there are many barriers, and so a uh, lead by example. Two um, might sound boring, but engage in multilateral discussions, uh, including G7, G20, and COP, uh, to put these um, the goals out there, which then signal like we are aiming for a COP decision, ideally, which includes the tripling of renewables, doubling energy efficiency, and and of course. Uh, fossil phase out, uh, so that would send a signal. But of course, uh, just as important or more so is uh, that in our bilateral and multi and plurilateral cooperation, we support the energy transition in Africa with public money and um, pub so climate finance, living up to our climate finance commitments there, and um, Ger Germany certainly is. And the Chancellor said that uh, already in 2022, we delivered our six billion um, annually uh, for that, leading to the 100 billion target uh, for all um, developed countries, which we pledged. But um, we have several projects. We have our International Climate Initiative, uh, funded in 2008. Uh, which since then has, uh, we have spent over six billion on projects for climate um, protection, not just energy. Energy, um, it was, for example, in the last year, 
3 um, billion euros on specifically um, supporting regulatory frameworks, supporting grids infrastructure, um, and also market design and skills development. And, and we've heard it before, and this is really key, is the financing. Um, so what we need uh, for developing countries is to get, to get the money, to get the private finance there as well. Um, things we can do for that is address currency risks, currency trade risks, address the investment risk by taking off sort of the, the first, first uh, base through public money. Um, we, can, uh, we can support with the regulatory frameworks. Um, uh, recently, for example, we, had, uh, we have a project on the shift project in Vietnam. It's not in Africa, but it's in Vietnam where we enhance know-how and capacity of public and private stakeholders in the area of green finance. Um, often there is a skill needed before the money uh, can, can be even taken up or projects can be filed so that they will get investment. Uh, we also have several projects that simply support the creation of projects at various stages to then feed into the pipeline. Uh, and one other example is the Emerging Market Climate Action Fund, MCAF, which is a fund of fund which supports fund managers in, in, a, in emerging markets. And then finally, one, one key, uh, key thing we all have to do is really change the international financial architecture, um, which was devised uh, several decades ago, which is not fitting for the risks uh, and challenges we are facing today to enable developing countries to actually uh, support the energy and, uh, transition and development instead of um, having to pay their debts. <laughs> Thanks. Can I, can I just jump in on one thing from Please. both Vera and, and, and Charles? I mean, to talk about the energy transition for Africa is not really accurate when there's still 600 million people that don't have access to electricity, and that's another place where I feel like the conversation and the goal around tripling renewable energy is quite, is quite relevant. Um, at the same time, the African countries, to Vera's point, are paying twice the amount to borrow money against these projects that we know are going to create health and livelihood and economic benefits over, over the long term. And so it's just a different conversation. And I think one of the things that's been most encouraging to me in the discussions this week has been um, the clarity of vision from many of the African heads of state and business leaders saying, you know, we, we must stop looking at Africa uh, and countries across Africa as, you know, victims and recipients, but instead the incredible investment opportunity where we're going to need this energy for all productive uses in growing economies and populations. We've got an incredibly young, vibrant, growing workforce um, and 60% of the world's solar resources. So there's just incredible opportunity there, and I think the, the sort of um, unified vision and call to action around that has been a, an important um, political dynamic that's different in part thanks to the Africa Climate Summit um, and other developments over the past year than, than what we've had in the past. Yeah, no, thanks for that intervention, Anthea. So, you know, it is so important for us to think about access as not a separate but a tightly linked issue and, and especially one that enables so much economic growth alongside that, that then gets into this, this virtuous cycle in the end of, of being able to lift everyone in the economy forward here. Um, you know, I, Charles, if we go back, I'd love your response to this, right, on, on both fronts. I heard, you know, from, uh, from Vera, you know, uh, le certainly delivering on their leadership commitments, but I, I heard uh, capacity building, you know, capital and, and financial architecture remodeling. I heard, I heard uh, uh, current managing some of the currency risks, and, and right now the interest rates in in Africa in particular are border on criminal, right, relative to to what we we need to ensure everyone participates. Um, you know, as you think about those different commitments, you had a chance to hear them from, at the beginning of the week. Have they evolved, right? Um, are they satisfactory? Uh, uh, you know, and, and in particular, you know, as you think about going forward, what else does there need to be? So especially we address this vulnerable, this most vulnerable population that Antha just, just alluded to. Um, 
has it evolved? Um, that's, that's a difficult one. Um, the, um, I mean, I guess the, the, the first intervention is, is just around, um, and, and I think you've captured it very well. I think, Antha, you're saying double. It's more like triple. We're looking at sort of interest rates of 16% to 17% for some of the projects, which, which again sort of trickle down and, and, and affect the affordability question. So then you're not really finding um, that thing balancing. Um, I mean, going back again to the, the, uh, the Africa Climate Summit, it was actually, you know, it was initially envisioned as a climate action summit, where it wasn't about coming and making new commitments. It was more about actually getting it done. And I think that's that's what a lot of people are saying on the continent now. Let's let's get it done. Let's try and look for ways to actually, you know, actualize all these commitments, um, so that you can start now seeing the results of of some of these commitments, right? So people are not just standing in front of cameras and smiling and saying, you know, we're committing. X amount. It's now how do you get it done? And I think that that is critical. And what we've, what we are also saying is that there's also easy opportunities, right? So instead of waiting for you know sort of a greenfield project, is how do you start expanding the already existing projects? So how do you expand the wind, our wind projects? How do you expand the geothermal so that you start with sort of the quick wins, so that you're actually showing sort of you know proof of concept because that's what you need, right? If you're going to wait until 10 years, I mean if it our target is by 2030. I mean, that's less than, you know, we're actually at the end of 2023 now, so you have less than uh, than six years to, to try and achieve that. So, and I think, so we need to start looking at the, the easy ways to expand and scale up what's already existing, and then address some of the infrastructure challenges, right? So, which, you know, our transmission, our age, aging transmission lines, our grids, um, that are becoming more and more expensive because they're so inefficient that people are moving off of them, and then everyone else has to keep sharing what is left there in the cost. So it's getting, you know, it's it's affecting the affordability of actually getting access to the grid. And so those are, to me, those are some some of the quick wins that we we need to see uh, very quickly. Yeah. Thanks, Charles. Uh, you know, um, I want I do want to come back, Antha, to you a little bit about, you know, if we think about the need, right, again, among the most vulnerable, and, and especially when we start layering on electrification for, for either because you don't have it right now, or you know, if you're fortunate enough to be able to access you know, electrified two and three wheelers or, or even EVs, you start to see kind of electricity demand build up. And you've alluded to coal shutdown and some of the challenges, but as we electrify and drive up, there is the risk that we use more fossil fuels, right, in response to that. And, and in certain parts of, of Africa in particular, but other parts of the world, you know, there are new discoveries and other things that are underway that, that compel, right, to, to participate in the last energy economy rather than build the next. You at Bloomberg have been deep on this issue, and I know you've already touched on it a little bit, but, but what else do we need, right, to make sure that the transition to, to green happens without flowing through brown again? Right? Yeah. Well, I'll go back to, to my point, which is, you know, for, for us, what do we see our um, strongest contribution as in philanthropy? And for us, that goes back to the opportunities around government policy. So what we really need is the, the, certain, the sort of certainty um, for investors and others that's provided by a clear um, uh, benchmark from governments. And so that involves, I think, both the phasing out of fossil fuels combined with, and, and a clear target and timeline for that, um, combined with the investment opportunity in renewable energy. And I think, you know, back to the conversation we were just having, we're seeing this beginning to happen um, in countries in Africa, where now this week Ghana announced its uh, energy transition investment plan. I think it's notable that it's called an investment plan, not just an energy plan. Um, Nigeria announced one last year as well. Um, but I think for some of the, the conversations in Southeast Asia, for example, the, the question of how quickly you can get out of coal and what the managed phase out um, can look like is is a really important um, you know p side of the coin as well. So um, this week there were some I think very helpful first of their kind conversations, um, including at the uh, transition finance action forum, which some of you may have been at at the the Plaza Hotel on Tuesday. Um, where it brought together the financial and energy regulators 
um, with the MDBs and private investors on this question of how we phase out fossil assets, on what timelines, what are the financial mechanisms for doing that, and, and RMI has been a, a pioneer in a lot of this work, um, and, and I think central to the massive contributions that we've had in, in Europe and in the U.S. in getting pu public dollars to actually enable that buy down and create much more opportunity for, for private investment. Um, so I think that has been a critical piece. And for those who saw it, I really liked the, um, the op-ed this week by Fatih Biral and, and John Kerry on this question um, that, that likened uh, just doing renewables investment without managed phase out of fossil assets. Uh, they compared that to training for a marathon while smoking five cigarettes a day. <laughs> Um, and as a runner, I think that was, uh, you know, that, that resonated with me. So, so I think that's the case we have to make. Um, and I think these other dynamics then with consumers and the opportunity um, with some of what governments can do on uh, investing in the grid with some of the South-South collaboration on where grid investment, digitization, and those dynamics can actually help um, create some new solutions that, that we haven't seen before in the countries like Europe and the U.S. that have already locked ourselves into to fossil fuels in a ja damaging way and just need to buy them down as quickly as we can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anta. And, and you know, I do, besides nicotine patches for the planet, right, as a, as a way to, to get into shape to run this here, I, there is, you know, I just wanted to, to give you an opportunity, Bruce, to talk a little bit about, okay, so what if we get that? What if we're successful in getting the UN aligned, right? And the UN comes forward and, and nations around the world say, yes, tripling, we'll do it. Doubling, double down, triple up, we're gonna do it. Um, you've talked about some of the barriers, but, but let's talk about, you know, 68 days to get there right now, where we'll, we'll get to this, what happens in the 68 days thereafter? What happens, you know, kind of in the, the 180 days, the 365 days thereafter? that really needs to keep us all on track here. Um, uh, whether it be, you know, likely not led by the UN at that point, that's gonna be your constituency in the private sector, that's gonna be local government. Um, what can we expect? What should we all be advocating for as we go forward? Yeah, thanks, and before, before I come on to that, I'd like to just come back to this, this great discussion about the vacuum uh, and the energy access in Africa in particular, but also other markets in the world because you know, although we said, yes, we can. I mean, our industry is in a desperate place right now to deliver on those targets. Um, and if we don't deliver, if projects keep falling over offshore wind in the US, no bidders for auctions in the UK on offshore wind, and the struggles that, that Charles mentioned, by the way, absolute pleasure to be on panels with you. <laughs> let's, let's continue this. I imagine but, you all know how you like each other's coffee here by now. Yeah. <laughs> But that, that vacuum will be filled by fossil fuels. If renewables don't deliver, I mean, the estimate is something like that we as the renewables lobby uh, outgunned 800 to one in terms of dollar spend on lobbying versus the fossil fuel lobby. They're not standing still. So they're out there lobbying, and you know, Africa is a case in point of how they will step in if we don't. So that's really critical piece. Um, in terms of the target, targets are great, you know, to focus the mind, but it's just not enough. Uh, and Daniele mentioned earlier, you know, the G20 text, it says tripling in there, but it also says same ambition for low emission and clean. Um, and so we would like unambiguous language in the COP decision. Ideally, probably idealistically, we'd like it cascaded into NDCs. So we have accountability at the country level. Uh, and then we roll out effective policies to address those main barriers, permitting, grids, financing, and supply chains. Lauren's great presentation, by the way, from RMI, as always. We would just question the continued cost reduction of renewables. Uh, we're now seeing inflation having an effect, and we would argue that we should mo look more at value uh, than price or cost. Um, the UK, again, is a case in point. You know, the recent offshore auction, they pushed the price down to 40 pounds per megawatt hour. No one bid, yeah, whereas gas is somewhere north of uh, 100. Why do we need offshore wind at 40? Why can't we have it at 100? Why can't we recognize the value that renewables deliver? Oh, and by the way, while I'm on the UK, and Vera mentioned lead from the front or show leadership, 
you know, that's a perfect example. If you saw the news of, uh, of the UK Prime Minister over the last few days, you'll see how not to lead from the front, and especially during New York Climate Week. So we have it, we lose it. You know, and that's the policy uh, conundrum we face. We need long-term investment signals, as Antha said, vitally and, and urgently. So going to your point, I mean, you know, what next? If we get the target, we will celebrate. If we don't, we'll express disappointment. But it's not about that. It's about getting it done at the country level. So going into countries and discussing with them, you know, work on the policy targets to, uh, to get that done. And interestingly, if countries don't do it, others will. We had a fascinating meeting with um, the, the regions. So it was Al Gore was hosting this meeting with the Premier of Quebec, uh, the Premier of Scotland, and various other regions around the world. And they said they will step in. And in fact, they are stepping in where they can, uh, where the country, the central government does not. And I think, so we will explore all options where there's uh, interest from the government and it's interesting to do it. You know, so low hanging fruit first. Our focus is Global South. You know, get it done in the Global South and facilitate as much as possible in terms of low cost financing, uh, the technology, and the benefits, as Vera said, are enormous, way beyond just climate change. Energy access, health benefits, clean. I mean, our strap line is clean, secure, and just. That's what renewables can deliver. And if we do that in an effective way and scale renewables in a fair and equitable way, the benefits for the planet, but also local communities, will be enormous. It's an enormous challenge, John. I have to say, our industry, we said 11,000 gigawatts, but we're deeply concerned whether we can actually reach it or not, given the current state of play and some of the policy discussions. Thanks. Yeah, well, thanks uh, for your leadership here. Thanks for Bloomberg's leadership as well. When it comes to subnational, you know, kind of uh, engagement and helping to make sure that everyone is moving together just in spite of or despite what's happening at the national level, I think, Anthony, your organization is as good as any in mobilizing. Um, I do, I'm going to open it up to you all, so please get your questions ready here in a moment. But first, I, I just want to run down, starting with Charles here, you know, we've talked a lot about messaging, right, um, and uh, the importance of it, and I, I'd love for each of you to give the audience a sound bite of why you support the tripling target, right, and what, what makes the difference for you. Um, just so we all kind of leave with some common language or some recognition of different perspectives and what it means here going forward uh, before we, we turn to the audience here for their questions. Um, I thought Bruce would sh uh, shy away from saying, get it done. I thought Boris Johnson made that uh, pretty unpopular. Um, <laughs> the, um, I, I mean, for... <laughs> um, I, I just, I just want to say, I mean, the, the start off with what I, I mentioned initially around that fossil fuel lock-in, and just give an example that you know, in Kenya we had um, sort of power rationing in the late 90s uh, because our hydro, because it was majority hydro at the time, um, and so because of the power rationing we brought in all this heavy fuel oil and diesel generators, which you're still paying for now. And that's actually one of the biggest sort of lock-in, I mean, our, one of our most, some of our most expensive power plants are actually sort of the heavy fuel oil and diesel um, generators. And that was in sort of the late 90s. And so when we talk about these gaps that are already existing, you're seeing the gaps in South Africa, the gaps in, you know, in other countries, we need, like Bruce says, to sort of, you know, really scale up very quickly before those gaps are filled. Because once you fill that gap, then you're locked in, right? And so, um, especially for the continent, one of the biggest challenges is take or pay contracts, where you pay whether you use it or not. I mean, it's just, it's just sort of like a, it's a heavy weight on a lot of countries because they just have to, to pay. And, and that's because there was a need. So, so because we had a need then, you know, and that's, that's, that was what was available, that was what was quickly scalable, right? So now we need to make you know, renewables quickly scalable so that they can actually fill those gaps now. Yeah. Uh, Vera. Well, well the, why the tripling narrative? I think the yes we can spirit uh, as a signal to people, communities, businesses, the finance sector is, uh, is definitely uh, one of the reasons to do it that way. Uh, that we need to triple is clear. 
And I think this is definitely a, a yes we can sort of panel and it's a, it's a pleasure to be on it uh, again with some of you. And I just wanted to uh, point out two more things. Uh, they've come up in the discussion, but I think they should, uh, and Anthony you mentioned it, and, and others too. Depending on where we're talking about uh, the tripling and uh, the phase out or down of coal, the just element is really, really important uh, because in countries that are very heavily invested in coal and countries that might be thinking about investing in gas and oil more, um, that is very, uh, that is difficult. We have to show and support communities and people and also businesses uh, in the, maybe I should say transformation, not transition, uh, because otherwise if we don't have that support, it's not gonna happen. And, and that often is not just a question of which technology, is it coal or is it renewables or gas or oil, um, but it's often a question that uh, really addresses the whole of the political economy. There's much more behind it uh, than, than just that question. There's much more in it than just, you know, do we have carbon pricing maybe to give the right signals, but it's how the whole economy of a country is structured. So this is also something that we need to take care of. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vera. Bruce? Yeah, I mean, we, we see this as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Yeah, it's really now or never. You know, I'll pause for effect, but, you know, we've got to take this extremely seriously. Um, the target is, you know, it, it sets the direction for, for industry, for policymakers, for, for financiers. You know, back in May, it was Irina uh, Francesco Lacamera, the DG, I was chatting to him about it, and they gave us the confidence to believe in it. They did the modeling, and we thought, you know, yes, we can, but then we looked at the challenges. I thought, okay, we'll set it anyway, because it starts a conversation about the how. How can we do it? Who's going to pay for it? Where are we going to do it? Those are great questions, and that's what we want to address. One last comment about the why, and especially the climate. Someone commented on my socks. Uh, they, I'm a, an ambassador for Cycling for Climate, which is an organization that promotes sustainable transport around the world to try and decarbonize transportation. Um, so they're my cycling socks, usually. But they're the climate stripes, as you can see, um, dating back to 1950 to today. My parents were born here, I was born here. <laughs> my two boys were born here. And, you know, where will this end? You know, so I'm just saying, we, 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 we urgently need to take action from all stakeholders, and I would implore policymakers uh, to step up and show leadership, Vera, and thank you for your leadership. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'll just echo everything that's been said um, and only add there's, there's a pretty rich and robust um, set of social science data that shows that you're a lot more likely to reach a goal if you set a goal. So I think this is, um, this is important in that regard. Um, I think the, the other um, dynamic we face is that one of the biggest risks to climate progress right now is um, politics, not technology, not investment. And to avoid the kind of backlash um, that we're seeing very much um, promoted by the fossil fuel industry, but, but utilizing a lot of very real societal challenges in the transition, um, we, we really need to, in addition to the tripling renewables goal, focus on how we do the managed phase out of fossil assets in a way that um, does enable a just transition and mobilizes philanthropy and government funding and private sector where it can um, around the, the, um, the very real societal transitions um, that have to happen to, to enable these approaches. So I think there's some successful um, pilots underway, uh, shall we say, very large-scale pilots um, in South Africa and in Indonesia um, as two examples on the Just Energy Transition Partnerships, but I think getting those right will be a critical element of this work as well. Thank you. Amazing comments. Um, uh, Vera, I just want to thank you for being here with us. I know you have to run. Um, uh, uh, we greatly appreciate not just being here, but your leadership for Germany, for the world here, in helping us all set the right ambition, set the right goals so that we're actually able to achieve them. So with that, I'm going to invite you or let you join if you want a last word for this audience. <laughs> just a last word. Uh, thank you, and, and uh, thanks 
for the leadership of everyone uh, uh, on this panel and who you're representing, and I'm sure this goes uh, to everyone who's listening. Uh, maybe uh, depending on what, you, what your lines of thoughts are, if you agree or not to agree, but it's so important to engage in these discussions and, and just see what, what are the convincing arguments, what, what are the facts, and how can we actually message them in the best way. So thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And good discussion. Thank you. And uh, Laurence, I'm going to invite you back up here to, to fill a spot. Um, and because we know all hard questions are going to be directed toward you. Um, but uh, are there questions from, and we've got a runner. All right. Uh, Jacqueline, right here in the front to begin with. Or, 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 I'm sorry, Raquel. I'm, that's all right. I like. I prefer Jacqueline. I think I'm gonna. I'm gonna go with that. I feel like I'm gonna have a conversation with Mom. All right. Thank you so much. Such an excellent panel, and I really, really appreciate uh, all of the information that you shared. Um, and we are. I'm Raquel Moses from the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator. We uh, represent 28 countries who are pursuing climate action and working together. And there was a point that both of you made that I thought was really important about the fossil fuel, the um, renewables reducing in price. And part of what the challenge in that is, is that people are making investment decisions now, not just on implementing, but on building factories to manufacture. And when you're seeing this precipitous fall that's projected, it makes investment decisions about getting into that market really difficult. So what are we, I, I really appreciate it when you were like, listen, why not $100? Because in addition to it being cost competitive now, it also has so many other add-on benefits. So why are we having this race to zero in terms of the price of renewables, especially on the manufacturing side? And we want to be competitive with China, but we can't compete ourselves into a price that doesn't work. So how do we, how do we address that meaningfully so that we can get more market entrance that can allow us to then build the factories that, that can produce the supply that we need and also in our region participate in our own energy independence, not just being customers but also um, producers. That's question one. Question two. <laughs> Sorry for the long. The second question isn't, isn't as long. But from a Bloomberg philanthropy standpoint, I, I think you guys are doing such incredible and amazing work. But what is your position on impact investment? We're seeing so many people who are like, we're impact investors, but then they're looking for commercial returns and commercial risk. And I'm like, well, that's just investment. That's not. So what is the role of philanthropy in not just in, in sort of helping to de-risk or helping to reduce the return that some of these, these impact investors are looking for? Because we have what we deem shovel worthy, but not necessarily shovel ready. And through amazing work with RMI, we're helping to close that gap, but there is still a big gap to fill between getting access to the capital that's available and the readiness of the projects and being able to just, I think there's an avalanche of, of development that can take place if we address that issue. So those are my questions. Great question, Raquel. And you know, we as the renewables industry, we're a victim of our own success. You know, we were always preaching lower cost, lower cost, we can get the cost down. Um, and now, we, you know, for, for several reasons, that's starting to hurt us. Because the profit margins are low, the auctions are ridiculous, even negative bidding in some markets, and it exactly structurally disincentivizes countries to build manufacturing facilities. So we would definitely advocate a diverse, and resilient, sustainable supply chain, so local manufacturing. It, there's several things that need to happen. One is the local market needs to be there, local either in your country or neighboring countries. We do not want to be exporting wind turbines across the world. Um, so we need that local market in place. Um, there's some examples. I mean, the IRA in the US is a, a fascinating and extremely successful way of bringing manufacturing uh, into a country. And one could argue, you know, how it's done, but it's a very effective way of targeting Wall Street, you know, tax, it, is, it just works. Whereas in Europe, we, you know, we love regulation, we love complex regulation, and it, the money doesn't flow as fast or as effectively. 
So there are ways to do it, um, to get uh, financial flows and manufacturing to take off in the countries. Um, so, I mean, I'll stop there, but it's, it's exactly when we build out renewables at scale to 11,000 gigawatts, we need to make sure that those markets, especially in the global south, have the benefits of local investment, jobs, skills, and sustainable uh, supply chains. Thanks. Uh, on your question of philanthropy, I would just say two, two things. Um, one, we see a lot of gaps on the ground in just the infrastructure required to get the first gigawatt of power done. And so that's an interesting role for philanthropy in terms of just what's possible, where can you cite it, how, connecting the developers with the money. I think on your question of people expecting commercial returns, um, we see that both um, on the private sector where there is a real gap in the experts who are just looking at these markets with eyes open and, and real um, openness and creativity. There's not a lot of people who are looking at the deals and just putting in that elbow grease to, to, to get them done in some of these places. So, so that's a problem we need to solve. I think the other piece of the problem is the development banks. And in the cases where they're expecting um, close to commercial returns, we've just, that's got to be a big piece of the modernization agenda. And so philanthropy in part is those places where the, the kind of um, quick strategic project um, money can help. But second is just, um, helping create the kind of cohesion and convening to speak with one voice to remove some of these barriers. Brilliant. Charles, anything else you want to add? Are you yeah, um, I mean, I'll just, again, go back to the Nairobi Declaration, which actually speaks of um, processing of um, Africa's raw materials, sort of like, you know, bringing it back to Africa. Because, um, and I'll try and share, I was trying to, I can't remember which report it was, but there's sort of that curve of solar panels in South Africa, where this, it reached this sort of peak where now it's spur demand sort of locally. Um, and so how do we spur that, whether it's that policy interventions that, that are needed to, to be done to do that, yeah. Brilliant. Other other questions. Uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, we're we're gonna only go to half past. So let's let's try and be quick here. Um, uh, to yes. Um, I'll also be quick. And then thank you so much for this wonderful panel. Um, I'm a student right now at NYU, and then I'm really interested in this topic. So I guess one big question I want to ask in general for everyone would be, how do you think that either it will be private sector philanthropy such as Bloomberg or your company, how do you cooperate or how do you um, find solution when there will be countries who you said about heavily investing in like fossil fuels and not so clean energy, like how do you work with that? Or, or um, is there any examples that you, you know, you accomplished before that you negotiated or like help them know that, oh, this is what we need to do. The world will not be okay if we don't have climate, like we're clean energy. So, Great. I'm yeah. going to, I'm going to just have one response from, from us. And Bruce, you were the quickest to raise your so, mic to the. Yeah, because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, because it's exciting. I mean, there are some really encouraging and positive examples. Brazil, India, Vietnam, there's many that we can point to where this has happened, that transition has taken place, and it's through dialogue with the policymakers, explaining the benefits that can be brought into the country. So, you know, we can, you know, on our website, there's many case studies of those, uh, you know, particular projects, regions, communities where renewables have been brought in, you know, to, to places that previously it was uh, un, un, unheard of. The next step is, of course, you know, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and other markets where, as we were discussing earlier, it's extremely difficult. Those have to be conversations with the policymakers. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, uh, Claire, there in the second row. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a really interesting event. Um, I'm Claire Fyson from Climate Analytics. Um, I, so we, I work for the Climate Action Tracker, and earlier this week we released a, an analysis looking at what needs to happen to the power sector to align with 1.5, uh, both globally and for 16 different countries. And we looked across renewables, coal and gas. We've heard a lot about coal phase out. We've heard a lot about renewables scale up. Gas needs to get out pretty quickly as well, so we find it falling to about well, less than 10% of electricity generation by 2030. And when we look across the 16 countries, across different geographies that we analyze, very few have a gas phase out target. So I wondered if you could comment on how we can bring more focus to fossil gas phase out. <laughs> Does anyone want to take gas and carbon tax? <laughs> um, I'll just 
again, I'll have a quick intervention on, on, on some of these conversations in terms of trying to push the needle, especially when you start moving towards tripling. As soon, and, and that, this happened for the Africa Climate Summit, as soon, even the carbon tax that, that you said, as soon, as soon as carbon tax was mentioned, you know, Angola was up, uh, Nigeria was saying, you know, no. Um, so it's, it's, it's about trying to push the needle and in some of these places it's very difficult. Um, but what you're finding is that there's slow movement in some of these ministries. So the countries that we work in, in terms of Ghana, Sierra Leone, um, a lot of the energy ministries, you know, have been going, uh, trying to get bid rounds and, and road shows for their oil projects, but they're not getting them. And so now they're starting to look at, okay, I mean, clearly there's, there's a shift here and we have to start addressing that shift. Um, and so there's movement. It's just that the movement's not necessarily um, as loud or as, um, you know, or, or, or very specific in terms of the, the phase out uh, language, yeah. Uh, Antha, why don't, yeah, why don't you jump Well, I was, ju I was just going to say, um, you know, the U.S. is the largest producer now of oil and gas, and, and I would just point to, um, it, it is not the whole answer, but we certainly need to create a situation in the U.S. where we're not locking in a bunch of new infrastructure and market share for this industry. And so one thing I would point to that that Mike Bloomberg announced this week, and, and people may have saw seen in the New York Times on... Thursday was a major new commitment to campaigning in the U.S. to stop the expansion of the fossil fuel industry into petrochemical production um, because we see this issue where uh, as their market share is decreasing in power generation and transportation, they're sort of saying the future looks bright, we're going to use these fossil fuels to make plastics. So um, I think that's one piece that, that makes a, a contribution, um, both on the local sort of environmental health and justice uh, matters, but also in the, the sort of pathway um, for the industry. Wonderful. We have time for one more question here. I'm going to go to the far corner there. Uh, thank you so much for your insights. I'm a student also at Columbia working at the uh, Center for Global Energy Policy, and actually I was a former intern at RMI, so it's nice to see some familiar faces. Um, I had a question. Not, uh, not a ringer. I didn't plant that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a question for Antha and for the whole panel generally, but you mentioned sort of these south-to-south -south collaborations as opposed to the traditional global north-to-south collaborations. I'm wondering how do you see those playing a role in the advancement of the energy transformation? Do you have you know, some promising stories, success stories? And also, what do you think needs to be done to accelerate those given the current limitations in capacity in a lot of these countries? I'll just be very quick. Um, I think the renewable energy target that um, uh, India has set of 500 gigawatts uh, on this very quick timeline um, is a really great example. And some of the experiences that uh, and, and assets that India has in terms of a connected grid, in terms of, um, you know, very early um, innovation in uh, using the digital economy to reach every, per every person um, are just a couple examples where um, countries that we work with in Africa, for example, are just hungry for that kind of information. And so part of the role of philanthropy, I think, is just paying for the, you know, people to have the time to dig into uh, and exchange those kind of lessons and, and knowledge. Well. Thank you, Antha, and thank you all. This has been an invigorating conversation. I know for those of you who have questions still, try and corner one of us at the front here. We'll do our best to stick around, um, uh, but keep the conversation going for sure. I want to. I, I just want to thank uh, Antha, Bruce, um, you know Charles, and Laurence here for sharing not just your time and your insights, but your renewable energy here at the end of the week to fully get through. Um, we're all deeply appreciative of you being here. You know, we, we at RMI, our founder often says, you know, you can't depress people into action, right? Um, and, and I think, you know, setting a, setting a goal, right, is the first, that's the first requirement to getting to that goal. We heard lots of barriers and we heard lots of, frankly, solutions and examples like India, uh, like some of the things that are happening in Africa right now on commitments. And, you know, at some point we just need to will this all into existence and believe that that goal can be achieved and work toward it. 
And we look forward to all of you carrying this message over the next 68 days, figuring out a way to set that ambition, and then working for the next 68, 120, 150 year, seven years we've got to get there, right? Uh, let's all do it together. Um, thank you so much. Enjoy the, the last day of Climate Week. <laughs>